Back now on America's Forum, we want to take a look at a developing story, news from United Press International. The website UPI.com, you see the headline, most of Tikrit freed from the Islamic State, a.k.a. ISIS. And uh, we will continue to monitor those developments, but obviously well, that appears to be a severe military setback for ISIS and a victory for allies in the Middle East. And obviously one of the ways we deal with that is through intelligence, both the CIA and the NSA, the National Security Agency. Now yesterday, uh, as we were coming on the air, uh, a very troubling development and some chilling audio. I don't know if we have the audio now, but I'd like you to listen to it. What happened at Fort Meade housing the National Security Agency? Unfortunately, we cannot run the audio for you, but we can tell it. Well, let's go back now, and we do have that audio. Take a listen as it happened. Reported gunshot wounds, possible traumatic arrest at Tennessee Connector Road Gate. That very startling audio from yesterday's incident at the NSA's headquarters at Fort Meade, Maryland, an SUV came roaring toward the front gates, and uh, as it turned out, the security uh, forces on hand stopped the oncoming vehicle. They opened fire, leaving one uh, occupant of the SUV dead and the other identified as Kevin Fleming in critical condition. Authorities found a handgun and cocaine in the vehicle. The FBI says there is no evidence to suggest the drivers had any intentions to breach the NSA and were instead going on a joyride with a stolen SUV. Well, Whatever was going on, it does prompt a question about the security of one of our nation's largest intelligence agencies. For more on the story, we call on Tom Ruskin, former New York Police Department detective, and now the CMP, now with CMP Protective Investigative Group, and of course staying with us from Newsmax LA, our good friend Larry Elder. Tom, we're hearing the talk. The FBI says no evidence. The drivers wanted to breach the NSA. They were quick to say no connection to terrorism. Do you think our law enforcement officials are being totally candid with us? I do. I do. In this one case, it appears that these guys were in a joyride in a stolen car, a car that they had stolen from another man that they had met in a motel earlier in that day. And it appeared that they just didn't abide by police or police trying to stop them and eventually rammed a police car and were shot. Tom, the response this time was very, very different than the response from security when uh, that guy went on the White House lawn and ultimately made it into the White House. Do you think that the failure to take more aggressive action then uh, might have had uh, something to do with how aggressive the security personnel were with the NSA yesterday? Well, the police officers who guard the NSA and Fort Meade are different than the uniformed Secret Service detail around the White House, as well as the Capitol, which have the Capitol Police Department. I think that we're firming up security around our infrastructures and around our sense of governmental structures, and I think that that may have led to the aggressive stand that the cops took yesterday, justifiable, but the aggressive stand that they took yesterday. A minute 30 remains in this segment, Tom. After something like this, I would imagine that uh, security procedures are evaluated, re-evaluated in the form of an after-action review. In the wake of this, what questions do you have or what procedures do you think are being reviewed now at uh, Ford Meade? Well, I mean, we know that the car drove around one of the barriers that's supposed to stop a car. How could that happen and why weren't there concrete barriers on the side to stop that from happening, to at uh, least let that car get in that close? So those are the type of things. Relative to the shooting, everything I've seen thus far, to me it looks like a good shooting, but again, it's very preliminary. And uh, again, we saw immediate action by the uh, NSA police there at Ford Meade. We think about uh, a shooting at Langley several years ago involving one of, the, uh, one of the people there on the CIA campus. And as you said, we saw a very forceful response. Uh, but obviously, 
more will be evaluated in the form of traffic barriers and other actions that can be taken. Tom Ruskin, we'd ask you to stick around. Same thing from our good friend Larry Elder out of Newsmax LA. When we come back, uh, a new state law vetoed a bill in the state aides to represent in Congress, Arizona, having to do with cops involved in shootings. We'll talk about that next as America's Forum continues here on Newsmax TV. I think sent a very clear message to Arizona law enforcement and their families is what he thinks about their safety. And what, do you th what is that message? I think the message is he clearly isn't concerned with that. It's very, very perplexing to me how he didn't see that this was a, a, a safe, sound, and balanced approach to protect the officers and their families. Joe Kluwer, the president of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, known in that area by its acronym PLEA, saying that Arizona's new governor, Doug Ducey, does not respect cops. This is Governor Ducey vetoed a bill that would have protected the identity of police officers for 60 days were they involved in a shooting. Governor Ducey says the legislation was well-intentioned but fell short of protecting officers and their families. The bill had sought to shield officers from potential death threats and harassment due to several recent police shootings in Arizona and, of course, in the wake of those nationwide protests fueled uh, in the wake of that shooting this past summer in Ferguson, Missouri. Against all that backdrop, let's continue our conversation now with Tom Ruskin, the former New York police detective and uh, president of CMP Protective and Investigative Group, who is at Newsmax New York and from Newsmax LA, our good friend Larry Elder. So Tom, you heard the president of PLEA out in Phoenix, he's not happy with Governor Ducey's veto. What's your assessment? I think the governor got it right. I think that this bill was not properly formulated to protect the police officer's family. Cops have no further rights than anyone else. If they're involved in a shooting, it is my feeling that releasing their names doesn't endanger their lives. But when you release their home address, when you release their families' names, and you put their families in danger, that's where the bill and the laws should protect the families of officers. Officers have, you know, routinely been named in cases where they have been involved in a shooting, and that shouldn't change. Tom, what do most uh, states do? How do most states handle it? Well, I can speak for New York City. Within a reasonable amount of time, after a shooting, definitely within 24 hours, you know the officer's name who was involved in the shooting. You do not release their home address, and you do not release any family information on the officers, because that's protected. But a police department is capable of protecting an officer. In Officer Wilson's case, in Ferguson, a newspaper released all that information on his family and did put his family in, in danger. And that's where I think a bill or bills should be designed to protect the family members. So again, just to understand this with two minutes left, Tom, your friendly amendments offered here during our conversation would be for Arizona legislators to focus on some sort of shield law, not for the officers involved in the shooting themselves, but with relatives, next of kin, immediate family. Should it extend beyond that? Uh, anything that would endanger the officer's family or where he lives or she lives. But you know, in a time the police departments now have to be more transparent, to shield an officer's name in a shooting and maybe even a controversial shooting or incident would not bring the public and, and confidence in police departments to uh, bear with the respective police department involved in the incident. Tom, 30 seconds for your answer. In the case of Darren Wilson, we did not know his name. Uh, he ultimately was vindicated, but because we know his name, the likelihood of him ever returning uh, as a cop uh, is very remote. So isn't there a danger in identifying the cop's name uh, in the event that ultimately he's vindicated? Yeah, but you but listen, you know, in a day now of media and 24-hour media, to hold a cop's name is not going to help him protect himself. Darren Wilson's job was destroyed by the media and how the media portrayed him as a cop who may have shot someone who was unarmed with his hands up. We now know that not to be true. 
Tom Ruskin, we appreciate your take on this important question. And uh, again, in your mind, you believe new Arizona Governor Doug Ducey did the right thing in vetoing that bill. We thank you so much for your time. Coming up, Larry Elder comes back with me and we talk about Hillary Clinton and that server that was wiped clean. She's got some splanning to do.